Thank you for joining me again for another episode of Empower Apps. I'm your host, Leo Dion. Back with us is Erica Sadoon. Hey, Erica. Thanks for joining us again. Oh, it's my pleasure. So uh, I want to get more into the Swift argument parser and how that works. I think that sounds like a terrific idea because I am really thinking that there is a lot to go over. So thank you for taking the extra time so we could go into it in more depth. I could probably list a few reasons why the parser is better than what's out there previously. Have you worked with other libraries for building command line apps on Swift? Oh yeah, bunches. I, I made my way kind of like a dilettante through them and... Eventually, I ended up with Commander, which I don't know if it's still even being produced. It wasn't great. I shouldn't say that. That's mean. It was It was okay. It was okay in the very best sense of the word of being okay. Is that from Carthage? I don't know. Okay. I don't know. But... It wasn't a Carthage package, it it but you know it was just some stuff. I was able to put it into the project, and I was just never happy. And it was always a compromise. Now I'm not saying that Swift argument parser. Well, it's no compromise anymore because of course it is, but I like it so much more in terms of the level of effort I have to put in and the quantity and quality of product I get out of it. So just from the most basic apps, it shrinks down and you tag whether something's, you know, a flag, an option, or an argument. You give it help you know, in your declarations that you can set some policies about it, although not nearly as many as I want. You should see the issue list over at the Swift Argument Parser. You know, Erica, 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 Erica. It's appalling, isn't it? I did. I did. I did. Yes. You were been quite busy the last few weeks, I can tell. <laughs> you know, when you're using it a lot, you tend to file bug reports and issue yeah. requests and stuff. And, you know, I even did a patch. So I had a patch merge, so technically I am a contributor. Congrats. I'm very proud of that. And I'm not sure I really want to invest the time unpaid into building out any of the other features that I've asked for, because right now my focus is more on the outreach and teaching, which, you know, is is more of my business model right now. Right. So you have presented already on this topic at Try Swift World, right? Yeah, I think I'm going to do it for the third time on Friday. What do you find is the biggest challenge that people have when they get started with the Swift argument parser? It's that they haven't used it before. Because every session I start, people are, oh, man, this is cool. This is easy. I'm totally going and writing my own. I don't think there's a problem getting people up and started with it. It's just a matter of introducing to them what is out there and what the nuances are. And I tend to be pretty detail focused. So what the workshop is, is I put everybody through building the same little application over and over and over. But each time through, we're adding a little tweak here, but adding a little tweak there so that you see the, not the entire scope of the Swift argument parser, but certainly within, you know, a two and a half hour, three hour period, you can cover pretty much everything you need to get started immediately. The other big issues, you know, you'll get to them eventually if you need them, but most people don't need things like subcommands. They can just, you know, use the basics and by walking them through it and Putting, having them do the code, it integrates it into the through repetition because you know repetition is the mother of learning. Mm -hmm. By typing and having it go through that physicality, that path, um, especially with coders, really tends to ingrain it in you because you've used it. Plus, you have your reference. You've created this, and mm -hmm. you've. 
added to it slowly with explanations and then repeated and repeated and made it bigger and bigger and bigger to the point where you, by the end, I think people have a really good grasp and can then create their own thing. And what I do is I send them home with an assignment so that they can apply it if they have the time. And that, again, gives that reinforcement component of learning. I did find it really difficult to get started. I think the one learning curve, which isn't really saying much to me, is just getting over how, like, the different terminology that's used. Uh, What's an argument? What's an option? And what's a flag? And then, like, the subcommand. Once you get over that, and, like, maybe you can explain to the audience what Mm -hmm. those exactly mean. Like, once you get that... Then it's like, oh, this is really easy. And then it's just the parsing is pretty automatic. So let me go through the three of them. An argument is a positional piece of information. For example, if you have six file names that you want to process, the first one is position one, the second one's position two, and so forth. You don't use dashes with arguments. And arguments are typically stored in an array, right? They can be stored in an array, but they don't have to be. Okay, they can be. Okay, okay, gotcha. All right. So if you had a command that said repeat hello five, you wouldn't want that in an array. What you would want is hello to be stored in a string and five to be stored in an int, and it's type safe. There is type checking in the Swift argument parser. Great. You have position one, position two. So you just grab that int and then repeat whatever text you got in, you know, position one. Boom, you're done. So Arguments are positional pieces of information with strong types. How does it know which position goes to which property within the struct? Does that make sense? It does make sense, and that's excellent. And it's 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 in order. So okay. if you declare the integer before the string or you declare it after the string, that is going to set up the stack of the information that's coming in and when it's parsing. So that's what arguments are. Arguments are just typed information that is put on the command line. Very cool. So then what's next? The other two are flags and flags are usually Booleans. They don't take arguments and they start with a dash or a double dash. So if you want something quoted, you would do double dash quoted or using the Unix uh, convention or minus Q. You know, using the first letter of the longer command, help, double dash help, or just minus H. A flag usually indicates a feature that should be turned on or not turned on. And the Swift argument parser not only offers the standard flags, it also offers a, little, a few little tweaks like allowing you to have inverted versions like no quotes. And you get that for free by marking it up. So flags are that. There's a separate form of flags where you use enumerations, which says basically you can pick one of these things. And the best example of that is audio. So if you have the types MP4, move, and GIF or whatever, some sort of moving GIF, Mm -hmm. there's also a ping now, but... You don't want the user to use, you know, all of them. They, If they're going to specify a format, they're going to specify one format. And so that can be a flag also by saying that your flag can be one of these cases within this enumeration. So that's what flags are. Flags are things that do not take any further information. They are just on off or they are setting a particular particular style. And the last thing is options. And options are key value pairs. And I don't know why they were called options right. because I guess calling them key value pairs was too much to put into, you know, the property wrapper that creates them, but they are key value pairs. They are again strongly typed. They have a name and they have a value. You can do it double dash output file foo.move that's a key value pair, or you can put an equal sign between the key and the value. It it supports both styles of input. Again, this is stuff that you've probably seen in Unix before. It's nothing new or spectacular, 
but it's so easy to declare. It's so easy to add aliases, whether it's custom shorts or custom long names, whether you're adding a default value to it. And everything with these is integrated really beautifully into optionals because you can make a flag mandatory or a optional or an option mandatory, or you can make it optional, you know, where the user does not have to put it into the command. And you can either give it a default value or you can just let it go to nil if you wanted to do that. And so that from both the user's viewpoint, how do I use this in, you know, just quick, easy way? And from the coder's viewpoint, comes to this beautiful meeting of Swift's expressiveness and Unix's succinctness. You try saying that three times fast. Right. Succinct. Succinctness. I think I did it. Succinctivitus. Succinctity? Hey, everyone. I want to let you know about Audible. Audible is a leading provider of spoken word entertainment and audiobooks, ranging from bestsellers to celebrity memoirs, news, business, and self-development. Every month, members get one credit to pick any title plus two Audible originals from a monthly selection and access to daily news digests from the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post, as well as guided meditation programs. I want to let you know about a few books that I've been reading or have been listening to using Audible. One book I want to recommend is Talking to Strangers, What We Should Know About the People We Don't Know by Malcolm Gladwell. As somebody who runs his own business, it's always helpful to understand and be able to interpret how people react or how people act in certain situations. And Talking to Strangers is a great book by Malcolm Gladwell. This book really investigates how we misinterpret people in all sorts of situations, everything from Bernie Madoff to Amanda Knox to uh, some of the situations in the news lately, uh, African-Americans. And I think uh, I highly, highly recommend this book and I highly recommend it through Audible because not only is it a reading of the book, but he also, Malcolm has his own podcast company and he understands the importance of having audio within the book of these actual situations that he talks about as well as like hearing about different court cases and court transcripts being brought to life, military, psychologists, scientists, criminologists, etc. The real people, the real interviews of the real people, the audio of those interviews are in the uh, Audible book. So I highly recommend it. And if you are interested, you can go to www.audibletrial.com slash empowerapps and you will get two free audiobooks free. Just go again to the link in the show notes, audibletrial.com slash empowerapps to get your free two audiobooks. Thank you again for listening to the program and thank you, Audible, for supporting our show. Yeah, and the documentation is actually like pretty decent as far as like explaining some of that to you. And then going back, there's the, uh, was it expressible by argument, mm -hmm. which is essentially think of it. I would say, think of it like, like the codable for arguments essentially to where you can like show how to make something parsable, uh, into an argument. And it's like not that hard to, to implement. It's a really, the architecture of this is a really good example of like what I would call like a convention over configuration type design where it's like you can easily get started and most of the defaults work. Uh, but if you need to customize pieces, it's not that hard to really get deep dive into it and like customize big chunks of what you want to do as far as parsing or validation or things like that. I think the biggest thing for this, which is one of the things that appealed to me is and a lot of technology appeals to me because I think it can be explained better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it draws me like, oh, here's an opportunity for something that's cool, but that I can explain better is that it, it works very well in terms of gaining proficiency by example. Yes. I love teaching by example and trying to simplify, simplify, simplify. And if you don't mind, if I take out this box sitting right next to me, 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. It drives me crazy when people insist that sample code has to be glorious and exciting and beautiful. I think that detracts from people learning. I like my code to be very, very tiny. One idea. How do I and give it an answer? Mm -hmm. And so that's why... I've gone to extreme lengths of weirdness, you know, currently and in the past to try to condense things down so a person can look at it, go over it and go, oh, that's how you do it. And then they can move on. Yeah. And that's really hard to do, to condense that kind of stuff into stuff that's simple. Because, like, it's easy to do the really complex stuff and make it a mess and make it beautiful. Uh, just as a blogger and somebody who's trying to explain stuff, it's when you, like, try to condense it and simplify it that it becomes, like, a really, like, that takes talent to do that. It is like constructing haikus of code. And Ooh, I like that. It is a deeply satisfying thing to make it simple, beautiful, and understandable so that a person will not only comprehend it, but be able to apply it immediately and be able to retain the knowledge of what the key factors are. When I see sample code that has, you know, a dozen groups and folders, all sorts of architectural stuff that's in there, all this complicated interrelationship, a person going into that project has to search to find the lesson that they are looking for. And I try to be a surgeon and pull away absolutely everything that doesn't affect that one key item that they're trying to learn. And I just... Well, maybe it's not a surgeon so much, a hacksaw, you know, out with you, out with you. So before we were recording, you were going to ask me, what have I been using? Well, maybe I'll ask you first. So what have you, what have you been uh, building with the Swift argument parser? I only have things from like this past week, which I, I opened a folder of what are the things that I currently have, you know, been working on. So I have now. And now I just love this little app. So I ended up putting it up on um, GitHub because apparently other people like it too. Um, when I do things like podcasts or meetings or anything that involves people in different time zones, I now lets me say, what time is it now? And then I give it a city name or place name or whatever because Apple's uh, geocoder is so good about place marks and locations. So I can say now Sao Paulo and I know what time it is for Guy Rambo. If I want to set up a phone call with him, I know I want to make the phone call at um, 5 p.m. my time. What time is that for him? Oh, it's 8 p.m. I can just do that with the utility. It, it, it's just stunningly useful. It's really simple. The best Command line utilities are always simple, except for Git. Because <sighs> Git's awesome. It's just not simple. Git can do everything. Okay, here it is now. Because you sent me a remind earlier. Uh, is now the one that you worked with Paul on, on that recent blog post? No. Now I just did by myself, simply because I needed to schedule times with Paul. Okay. So Paul is the reason for it, but he didn't actually code it. Yeah, because I saw your recent blog posts now. I'll post the link to now in the show notes. And then the other one you showed me uh, yesterday was Remind. And that is that you, so that has to use, does that work on every OS? I assume it only works on Mac OS, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the one that uses, that plugs into the notification center on the Mac to do notifications. It's only Mac OS and it's pure evil. And I love it. Right. Yep. Right. So remind me to stand up in 15 minutes. I have I, I have a little shell script that says all my reminds for the day, and it tells me when to stand up so that I have it just pop up. If I'm if I'm leaving for an appointment, I'll just say remind me in 10 minutes, you know, to get ready to go. Very cool. 
And it's the best command line utilities are just extremely useful, quick to invoke, and have a very limited scope of what they do. They don't try to be everything to everyone. Right, right. Which is probably more my vice, if anything. But you asked me, what else have I been doing? So, you know, in my folder of, you know, this week's sort of stuff, I did one that does color conversion. So I put in a hex value and it prints out um, the RGB values GB. In, in both int and uh, float, including the code. I have... This is like CG, <laughs> CG color code. Yeah, okay. Yeah. It, it, I called it color convert. Yeah, awesome. Is this available on GitHub? No, I haven't published that one. Okay. Um, it was. It's really everything I did, including now and remind, was meant to be sample code. But sometimes some things are so useful that they shouldn't just be sample code. So, you know, at that point, I kind of put them in my little hands. I let them spread their wings and fly to the world. Yeah. Um. Speaking of homebrew, yeah, let me see if I can figure out how to get this into home, how people can install it with homebrew. I need to create that tap so that th these can be installed with homebrew. Okay, another one is... Or at least get that Swift brew uh, thing working. <laughs> what were you going to say? Go ahead. So another one that I've been working on is called um, LNS. Have you done LN minus S? No. Okay, it creates a symbolic links between two files, but I can never remember okay. which goes first, the source or the target. I just can't remember. So LNS, which is based on a whole series of LNSs in various languages and scripts and so forth that people before me have done, I decided to do it in command, uh, you know, the, the Swift argument parser. And it, it's just really nice. I It is something I'm probably going to release because, again, it just got so nice and useful. And it uses um, NS File Manager to check to see whether files exist. It figures out one of these two exists or one of these is a directory. So I'll create a copy in that directory with a symbolic link. It's, I think, another winner in terms of coolness. Yet at the same time, for another sample code, I wrote something called Number Fact, which simply calls an API. And, you know, you give it a number and it just gives you a fact about that number, which is not terribly useful, but, you know, it's cool enough to be sample code. Right, right. Yeah, I think I know that's great for, like, when you're doing a workshop to show examples. Yeah, I'll definitely post those, at least the ones on GitHub, in the show notes. Yeah. If I do LNS, I'll probably put it out next week. Because it would need to be cleaned up a little bit. So to answer my question, so what I've been working on, mm -hmm. so three three apps, three apps, three, yeah. So uh, I've been ha helping uh, Dave Verer with his uh, SwiftPM.co uh, site, and I have written a validator. Uh, which validates each Swift package. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've moved that over from just a uh, Swift single Swift file to a uh, using the Swift argument parser. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not. I don't think it's in production technically yet, but it's it's moved over to Swift argument parser. That works really well. Nice. Um, that goes through and parses each Swift package in his JSON file and sees whether it's valid for the package manager. Mm -hmm. And then I work on my. Um, app for the Apple Watch, uh, Heart Twitch. Uh, it's the uh, it's an app that does live streaming of your heart rate. So you can then share a browser window of your heart rate from your Apple Watch. Mm -hmm. I have a command line tool for that nice. to fake, fake the Apple Watch part so I can test the website. Tooling is always a great use for this. That's yes. good. So like I basically there's a, there's like a talk or a blog post somewhere on this where where you can like fake the app using Swift package fake the watch app as a Swift package and take out the health kit and the watch kit components of it mm -hmm. so that way the you can test out the logic in production without having to run the actual app on the watch um, and so I've used the Swift argument parser for that to basically say hey here's the code for mm -hmm. the web socket. And then here's the uh, range of heart rate that I want you to randomly uh, spit out to the website. So that's the second case. 
Um, yeah, I think tooling is definitely like you like testing things like that. This is where like moving your app over to command mm -hmm. is a lot easier for developers. And then recently I am working on a command line tool called Eggseed uh, for basically setting up a Swift package. It calls like Swift package create, but it also sets up the package for continuous integration testing uh, for GitHub, Travis CI, uh, Bitrise, and uh, Circle CI. So that's that's how that works. CI is my nemesis. Uh, I love it. Um, I it's a challenge. I love it until it stops working. Like because of your code or because of the CI? Because of the CI. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, I've definitely learned a lot as far as the... I mean, I love continuous integration. I just... It's specific tools that have given me a bit of a heartache in the past. GitHub Actions has been really nice. I think that's been the, my favorite out of the four that I've been working with. Uh, each, each one can have its little quirk. Travis, they do weird stuff with their machines. Mm -hmm. They didn't until recently, they were using Xcode 11.4 on Mojave or something. Mm -hmm. And it was causing a ton of issues, but I think they finally upgraded to uh, Catalina. Mm -hmm. So now like things like combine actually work. And then circle CI, I had a couple issues with the way uh, their Docker images are set up. Uh, but other than that, like, yeah, it's been really nice to just like, I want to make sure that my app works on every machine, not just my machine. And I think CI is a great way to do that. So I'll post links to those, uh, at least to the ones that are public uh, in the show notes for you to take a look at. But yeah, the argument parser is just really nice. One of the things I wanted to ask you before we close out, um, and I noticed this with your recent blog post about now. I did a talk at a uh, UI conf on asynchronous uh, development programming in Swift. And one of the challenges that I've had is dealing with asynchronous operations within the Swift argument parser. The way I've gone around it is like playing around with the run loop or running something on a different dispatch queue and then setting up a semaphore. What What's like your recommendation for something like that? Because for instance, like I need to download a file or I need to, um, just run things, run something continuously until command C is sent out or something like that. Like, what what do you do in those cases while using the Swift argument parser? I actually ended up trying a whole bunch of different approaches, but the one that just seemed to work, <laughs> I'm kind of embarrassed about this, but it works consistently, reliably, is, you know, CF run loop run. It just is so reliable. Okay. Yeah, I saw C CF run loop. Yeah. Yeah, and I did uh, run loop. I'll do like run loop main or I'll do, um, I have, like with the current, with egg, egg seed, um, the Swift package thing, I'm just running a dispatch queue, mm -hmm. a separate dispatch queue, and then having a semaphore uh, wait and then exit from there. Because uh, just to, the, to those who don't know, like the way Swift argument parser works is, uh, I think it's like main is the uh, method that's run when you run your command. Yeah. And then you pretty much do all your, your work in there synchronously. But like, I don't know, like I kind of wish there was like a way to handle asynchronous operations a little bit easier in the Swift argument parser. Well, technically there's no heartbeat in command line app, we're just sort of cheating and putting one in there. Right, right. Because so there's there's apps, though, where, yeah, like underneath the hood, obviously. But I'm meaning I just want something to continuously run. Like, I don't necessarily want something to, like, shut down necessarily. Like, I guess, like, a while loop or a sem semaphore would be the way to get around that. Yeah. Or, like you said, CF run loop. And, you know, this is this is why we have the little ampersand so we can, you know, run it in the background and then kill it later. Right. Right. Exactly. And, you know, you can always set it up as, you know, a launch daemon or something. Yes. Yeah. There, there are lots of ways to get it into a higher level of execution than just do something, then print something, then stop. Right. So one of the, one of the things I'm interested in is building complex user interfaces using the terminal. Now, hear me out. So I don't know about you. I like Swift UI. 
And I like the way that you can create structures. But imagine, if you will, what if you could create a user interface using structs in ter- for terminal apps? Uh, I looked at a couple of interesting stuff with end curses and turnbox. <laughs> Yeah, curses is what I was going to say. Yeah, I wish there was something like that. I play NetHack. Right, right. Oh, yeah, I mean, right. it's 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 all curses. Welcome to 1981. I wish there was something like that, like a Swift UI for the terminal. Is there anything like that right now? Like, I would love to learn how no. to... No. It, it, people who use the command line are a few and hardy breed. We are the ranchers. We are the cowmen. We are the ones who seek the wild west where all else has become civilized. It is we who who ride into the sunset of bash and seashell. And while we have become legend, our numbers are few. And it's even fewer. If you had that Venn diagram of Swift developers, it's probably even fewer than that, yeah. to be honest. <laughs> Many of you have probably heard about App Store optimization and how it can get you more downloads. There's a lot of demand for apps right now, so it's a really great time to give it a try, and it's easier than you think. The folks at App Figures have an easy step-by-step guides and intuitive tools to do that, which many indie developers are using to get more downloads. The guys who run it are indie devs who had a need and created a tool. 11 years later, it's an all-in-one platform for developers who want to get more downloads and make more money with their apps. Try App Figures for free. And if you like it, use our special code EMPOWER3030 to get 30% off for the next three months. Thank you to App Figures for supporting our program. Now, occasionally you want to cross over. And, you know, sometimes I'll do hybridization with OSA script. Okay. Which is command line. Mm-hmm. OSA script, um, for those who don't know it, is a way to do Apple script from the command line. So you do have full, you know, system scripting. And you can even have, you know, dialogue boxes and so forth. And, you know, that's okay. It's just at a certain point, why not just write an app? Yeah, right. I think like I get what ended up happening um, is I got like deep dived into like the VT 100 codes and all the crazy stuff you could do there. (laughs) And I was like starting to be like, okay, how do I create like, how do I create a table? And like, how do I dynamically change the table? Oh my gosh. Terminal depending on the data. And it's like, (laughs) like I was trying to create Swift UI list in the terminal. Yeah. X term. Yeah. Right. And, um, there's just print. Um, I know there's stuff like, uh, is it Rainbow and Swifty Tables and stuff like that I was looking at. But um, uh, it's something, when I have that that hypothetical time, I'll, I'll work on for the, for the six of us. Are you familiar with the term niche? Yeah. Oh, very niche. It's totally, I totally get it. I, I'm not going to pretend. It's nichety quotient is high. The NQ is very, very large. (laughs) And then people will be like, why not build a Mac app? And it's like, yeah, you're right. But as far as like, even going simpler than that, is there any recommendations you have as far as like logging or tracking, like outputting progress with a terminal app in Swift? You mean like doing the the sig term or, you know, the kill minus info? Or just like if you're gonna write an like a command line tool, what's the what are some libraries for logging besides just using print? OS log. OS log. Okay, but there's no like. I think I think there's one that's one newer than that. Okay, it's like it was print then NS log then OS log and then I think there's one that's newer from last year. But since it didn't affect my work, I haven't gotten around to messing with it. Are you still just doing um, print in your app right now? It depends on the app. And also, print can do standard error as well as standard out. Oh, because you can say which pipe? Stream. Yeah, stream. Yeah. And the Swift argument parser also produces exit codes. So if you're doing meta scripting using the tools that you build with you know, the Swift argument parser, um, then you have to produce the correct statuses, you know, the exit status, so that you can use that in the logic of whatever scripting. So that's all supported. 
How does it know what status code to do depending on which error you exit with? Or does it not know that? Zero is good. Well, zero is good. But I mean, if you have... Non-zero is bad. Is that, okay. It's that simple. It's not like... So what I would say is, first of all, you, there are standard Unix codes. So just use the standard Unix codes if it me you know, if if that's going to work for you. And if they're not, document them, put it into the help file. And then, you know, when you create your error, you, you know, code is one of the fields of the error. So you just throw that. <laughs> I think I've reached peak nerd here. Yeah. When we start getting into VT one hundred codes and exit Unix exit codes, that's peak peak nerd. Is there anything else you want to cover with Swift Argument Parser? I'm just so happy with it. It Nate who runs it is really responsive. I know he has a ton of other responsibilities and DubDub is coming up and so forth, but it's really just been a pleasure to use. Do you think they're going to talk about it at DubDubDC? Oh, I'm sure there will be a session. There's got to be a session. Yeah. This thing is sweet. And then afterwards, nobody's going to want to take any of my workshops anymore. So it's a good thing I'm getting them all out now. <laughs> <laughs> I'd really like to write you know, a really short book on this. And I talked with Prague about this. And they said, are you out of your mind? <laughs> One, it's Apple. Two, it's version 006. <laughs> Actually, it was 005 at the time, but it's 006 now. And uh, this is Apple. They're going to change it, and they're going to give you no notice. There's no standard release, and they don't like code, you know, just to sit. (laughs) You know, anything you write about is going to be out of date in in about three seconds. So it may or may not work (laughs) out. Because I tell you, between iOS and Swift, I am so burned out on on software that keeps changing. Yeah, yeah. Whoever thought that a yearly update schedule for for a language was a great thing? Do you think things are going to be settling down, though? No. Okay. That was honest. That was a really honest id, ego, whatever sort of response there. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you think are some big changes to the language we'll see in the next few months? Oh, you can just see it in the change log. Everything's put up there. So head over to um, HTTPS, github.com, Apple, uh, Swift, and then just look for change log and look at the change log. And that will always precede the uh, Xcode implementation. I think 5.3 just is in the current Xcode now. Did that just happen? Oh, is it? Okay. The f- uh, whatever, 11.5. Yeah. Yeah. I think I saw people saying that, you know, 5.3 had, had made it. So, you know, you just look there and you go, oh, here's the new toys. And I see over time more and more that things are being driven from what I would call an Apple direction as opposed to a community direction. And really starting with Swift UI and you know before Swift UI was officially announced, it kind of like, I think Apple just got kind of tired of the Swift community and said, okay, we've got to get these things done. We're on a deadline. Let's put out you know some proposals, get those into the language, even though people don't understand why we're doing it, we need to have these for Swift UI. Let's just do it. Like property wrappers and uh, like some opaque return oh, types. Uh, what else? And there was, um, you know, the DSL stuff. Yes. Yeah. Right. You know, things that they needed right there and then. And I think that's been the trend. If you take a look at, at recent proposals, very few of them are what I would call really community sourced. There are a couple. There's one that uh, Dave DeLong got out, which was something I had tried to push like four years ago, but he finally got in there. Okay. Yeah, I'm just looking through some of the Swift 5.3 stuff right now. I, the big thing for me was Swift 5.3 was... Supposedly, uh, Windows support, 
uh, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. I don't know where that's at right now, but I know that's been the big... And one of the marvelous things about that is that um, the Swift Core team now has Windows Guy on it. So yes. I think yes. that's really cool. Yeah. Um, if Swift's going to grow Windows, definitely. Windows and Android would be awesome. Uh, but Windows, you know, at least for server-side Swift, now you, maybe you can get Vapor running on IIS or whatever uh, Windows uses right mm -hmm. now for its server. So that's, yeah. that's very, very cool. I love server-side as an idea. I don't know how cohesive it is. It's not an area I've really delved into much. My friend Gwyn is kind of living in there. Mm -hmm. So I would defer to her in terms of finding out more. In fact, she would be a really cool person to talk to. Yeah, she spoke at UIConf uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, at the same conference I spoke at. And she did a fantastic job. So I've done a lot with... Uh, server-side Swift, and we've had a few guests on. I think it'd be fantastic to have her join us as well at some point. I think I think we talked about everything. I know. The only things we didn't hit are, um, let's see, the produce price for potatoes and orange juice futures. <laughs> uh, it's, pr it's probably high. There we go. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you for having me. Uh, where can people find you online, Erica? You can find me at ericasadoon.com. You can follow me on Twitter at Erica Sadoon. Or, you know, just any variation of Erica and Sadoon usually gets to me. Exactly. And we'll have the links in the show notes as well. People can find me on Twitter at Leo G. Dion. Uh, my website for my company is breakdigit.com. I have my blog to the Swift content there. Thank you so much for joining me on this podcast. And we look forward to speaking with you again. 